the things that we do measure on a tilt test, heart rate, blood pressure, are probably inadequate. And I say that because it's really time that we update how we diagnose POTS. The tilt table test is a gold standard when it comes to diagnosing with people with POTS, but why don't we ever use it to do any testing of progress? If we're willing to do that tilt test on the front end because it has diagnostic value, then I also think that it's worth doing again. Let's implement a strategy and then we'll come back and we'll test it and we'll see if we're able to actually make the POTS better. Better from an objective standpoint and then look at how you're feeling and figure out, do those things line up? When I first started testing people in, uh, in an autonomic clinic, the things that were available, like the commonplace thing was you had people, you, you put a blood pressure cuff on and a pulse ox on, you had people lay down and then stand up and then you were just taking manual measurements. I was writing them down on a piece of paper with a pen right? And you're just measuring and you're going through that for 10 minutes. And then you're just trying to see if there's a heart rate change and a blood pressure change. But as I was doing that, I was realizing I was missing stuff, right? So like the first thing I realized I was missing was that as people stood up, they got inputs from their head movement. They got input, inputs from their muscles contracting that were kind of affecting some of the quality of the test. It became available to where people could get a tilt table I got a tilt table and that tilt table was huge because it allowed me, I was doing the same testing, but even just by not allowing people to have that motion to compensate, you could start to pull out more information from people, which was super helpful in our outcomes. But then I was noticing that there was another group of people where I would do the tilt test. And as I was measuring that heart rate, just serially every minute and measuring that blood pressure every minute, it felt like I was still missing something because I wasn't I wasn't detecting changes that were that would qual classify you for POTS or, or the static hypotension or, or these problems. But it was still super obvious that something was going on for this person. Right. You could see they were symptomatic. It forced me to start thinking about, like, how do I how do I understand this even better? So the second thing that I would change about how we diagnose POTS is to just simply change which variables we're looking at. The things that we do measure on a tilt test heart rate, blood pressure, are probably inadequate. And I say that because POTS has tachycardia in the name, so it leads us to look at the heart rate. But then the question is, is like, well, why is the heart rate high to start with? And is that the thing that we should be focused on? Is that the problem? In my perspective, from my experience, that tachycardia for a lot of people is actually the result of how your body is compensating for a problem. So that heart beating quickly is often a compensation for being able to keep pumping that blood into the brain. And if we're not able to do that successfully, that's where we start to see the symptoms that come with that, which are usually things like lightheadedness, feeling brain fog, feeling like your vision is affected, like you're blurry or it's not clear. You might feel dizzy. You might just feel lethargic and like, Ugh, short of breath and like hard to, hard to do life. The compensation for that is that you may feel jittery. You may feel sweaty. You may feel anxious. These are things that tend to happen as your body is trying to compensate for the fact that it's kind of getting choked out and not getting blood flow into the brain. So as you can imagine, looking at heart rate and blood pressure alone is insufficient because you can have normal heart rate. You can have a normal blood pressure and still have problems with getting blood flow into the brain. We had to start understanding what was going on in the brain. We could see that the symptoms were in the brain. There was a problem going on. And I had been reading all these studies from way back, right? So like there was work done in the 90s by Jay Goldstein. He was using SPEC scans. SPEC scans are, it's like a brain scan where you use a radioactive measurement that kind of measures the oxygen moving through the system. And from that, you can kind of infer blood flow. And even back then he was like, in these cases, there's something going on with the cerebral blood flow. And so you're like, that's really great. But like, I don't have access to a spec scan. We were using some stuff with, with the Amen clinics at the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't sufficient to be able to really understand what was going on. But I used to take the same bedside tests that we would do with people that we normally do seated, watching eye movements, testing the way they feel their body, testing their inner ear, testing their cognitive capacities, um, like, you know, even putting like video oculography on people. I would do it laying down 
And then I would tilt the table up and I would do it again with them tilted up and I would, I would look for the difference. I would do cognitive tasks like end back tests or just like serial sevens and I would test how fast they could do them laying down and I would test how fast they could do them standing up or just simple things like could they feel their feet? Could they move their hands? Could they move their eyes? And I became obsessed with that. I was finding that even though these people had normal blood pressures, these tests would be different when they were upright. So when you look at a spec, one of the problems we have is you can't take people lying down and then stand them up and look at the difference. You can't do it with an MRI because we can't get a magnet big enough to stuff in a room to be able to have people lay down and then stand up, right? I'm still looking for these things. Where I'm, If those of you that are out there that are building these things, call me. I'm still always looking. So the tool that, that we have come to use is called a transcranial Doppler ultrasound. And it's really helpful because we know that there are two main arteries that come in the front of the neck, two that go in the back of the neck. The two that go in the front of the neck turn into the middle cerebral arteries in the brain. And they're like the main trunks of the blood supply that go and feed all of the tissue of your brain. All the neurons in your brain have to get blood. They get it through anterior and posterior circulation. And that Doppler lets us measure those two middle cerebral arteries and we can see how much blood is flowing through them on a constant basis. So continuously measuring the blood flow into the brain gives us a huge advantage to be able to understand where these symptoms are coming from to start with. And the second piece of why we use the Doppler is it's not cumbersome. We don't have to have a dedicated room with giant Tesla magnets in hopes that we can be able to measure it. And as a matter of fact, if we use something like a SPECT or an fMRI, you have to do that laying down. But for most people with POTS, Laying down isn't the problem. The problem is being upright. So we have to use a tool that allows us to be measured both laying down and upright. And while we're moving and putting the head and neck and arms in different contexts to see what changes with the blood flow to the brain, that's where the transcranial Doppler is super useful. And that application is widely impactful for people that have POTS. Not only do I think it's important to do retesting, right? Do a pretest do a post-test, see if what we're doing is having the effect we want, but also can we, can we start to measure variables that are more important to these people that are experiencing POTS, that are experiencing orthostatic intolerance, because some of them won't even qualify for POTS. They might just have cerebral hypoperfusion. They might have hypocapnia, these things that don't show up on these other tests, and we run the risk of just washing them out, telling them they're okay, telling them maybe you just have anxiety which I think is a huge, huge loss when we have technology available that lets us be able to look into the brain to be able to see, are we getting blood flow there? You have no idea how validating it is for someone to say like, I feel like I'm going to pass out. And then you can point to the screen and say, look here, you can see how these blood flow variables change and see here's when you tilt up and you see that number just drop like a stone. You're not crazy. And that can be so useful for helping someone not only just be able to like feel validated, but then say, what do we do about it? And be able to do the thing and come back, serially measure that on an ongoing basis and see like, are you having an effect that you think you're having? And we're always looking for new ways to understand what's going on. But as it stands right now, being able to use that Doppler ultrasound allows us the freedom to move people through space to challenge their cognition, to challenge the movements of their body, to introduce new variables, to see where that system breaks. It's shocking sometimes to be able to look at someone and say, you know, I can see that blood flow dropping. And then for some people, it's simple things like turning your head is enough to tank it. For other people, doing a math problem. For other people, it's stimulating their feet. So there's all these different ways that create context for where that person will struggle, but we can't identify them if we don't have a way to calibrate or understand what's going on when we provide those inputs. Most of you have felt that feeling of you go in, you get a diagnosis, maybe you get offered a medication or you're given an exercise program, and then there's this period of time where you're supposed to execute it. You get to go back and have a second appointment months down the road, and you do that kind of medication adjustment, right? So all the questions become not around like what brought us here in the first place, but like, how can we tweak your meds? How are you feeling? What are things looking like? And there are things that are just kind of like 
so anticlimactic relative to what you originally came in for. That's my plea for other people or for you to seek out people that have that type of testing available. If you're really interested in dialing in and figuring out what the heck is wrong with me so that you can get to an outcome. And I understand that that's not for everyone. I understand that people have different um, different resources available. But if you're the type of person that is like, I won't live like this, then I think it's an excellent tool for you. And I think it's probably going to be, um, I'm not saying this with hyperbole because I'm not prone to it, but it's probably the thing that changes your life.